And it's uh, why we need a new covenant. <clears throat> so, uh, so uh, as you know, all of last year, all the messages from last year were Sunday school lessons on people, right? Uh, Old Testament people, New Testament people, right? We just, I, I kind of uh, bounced back and forth uh, to get us to understand the different personalities of Old Testament. And, and I'm trying to bring to you people that, some, some, maybe someone we knew but we didn't know very well, or someone we didn't know at all that had an important lesson to teach us. And so, and, and we need to remember that there's a reason why these people are written in the Bible. There's a reason why they're remembered. And then finally written hundreds of years later was because they're significant. God wanted us to remember that. And, and there's a reason. Right? There's a lesson in there for us. And so that's why I, that was last year. This year I'm looking at um, making changing things up a little bit. I'm going to start with uh, teachings from Paul. Oh my goodness. All those letters. Lots and lots of letters from Paul. So I'm thinking of for the New Testament, we're going to do letters of Paul. And then for the Old Testament, I was thinking uh, maybe lessons from Proverbs and from Psalms. So Psalms, Proverbs, right? Psalms. So we'll do, we'll do letters and Psalms. <laughs> it be kind of an interesting mix. But I think that, uh, I don't know. For me, I have to have that theme to kind of... Uh, otherwise, my brain goes everywhere, and I don't know where I'm going, and, and it gets. But if I can kind of keep some structure, I can find things, and God can like show me things a lot easier. Um, today's lesson um, was one that uh, I had, like at the beginning of the year, as I knew I was changing to this new format. Uh, God brought this as part of my daily reading in uh, my daily Bible. Ooh, I gotta do this first. And it fits in with a new year. I figured new year, new covenant. Let's talk about new. Okay? Let's talk about new. So uh, let's go into have you ever. So the first one, have you ever, uh, I, I don't even I had it up there and I took it out. But because it really didn't fit in, but I I, I can just ask you. Because I used to do these. I don't know. New year is when people uh, have new year resolutions, right? We're going to change something. It's an opportunity to say, I want more of this, or I want to do less of that, or something that you're going to make a commitment to do, right? And, and uh, I used to do those until I like broke every single one. <laughs> I was like, why, why do those? Because I know they're going to fail anyway. It's just really sad. Uh, so uh, how many of you, just raise your hand, uh, no judgment, how many of you still do New Year resolutions? I'm not going to ask you what they are. Might be too personal. How many of you still do them? New Year resolutions? One. Auntie Miriam. Wow. Auntie Miriam's a brute, man. I'm telling you. She, she is like disciplined. Oh, man. I'm telling you. She's, she was a drill sergeant. Oh, my God. She, she was awesome in the military. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, okay, I can see Exeter, <laughs> but not me, not anymore. Did, how many of you have never made a New Year's resolution? Right? Yeah, yeah, see, I, yeah. And, and, uh, and I noticed that those that just raised their hand, no, didn't raise their hand at the first one, which means, why? Because <laughs> I'm not going to do them. I'm not gonna. So, yeah, I usually fail usually within the first one. All right. So let's focus on what we're looking at today. Go old and new. And in fact, we just read Old and New Testament, right? We just read scripture from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. So we're wondering, why have the Old Testament and the New Testament? What's, what's, what is the Old Testament? Why is it the New Testament? Is it just because the New Testament has Jesus? Well, guess what? Jesus is in the Old Testament. Okay? If we were to look back in the Bible, all of it is revealing God, which is revealing Jesus, right? And and it starts with Jesus in Genesis, and it ends with Jesus in Revelation, right? Jesus is the entire book of the Bible. So why have an Old Testament and a New Testament? Okay? So that might be something you've ever wondered, and most of you are wondering. And 
could it be something that pertains back to an old covenant and a new covenant? Because there is an old covenant, and then there is a new covenant. But what is a covenant, right? So, uh, so yeah, so we need to figure out well, what's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. And then what is a covenant? We'll talk about that. And then what benefits do we have for living under God's covenant? Okay. So before we begin, let's uh, let's pray. And then we'll begin. Father God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this time that we can come and, and just hear your word and, and to learn from you. And Father, we just thank you for the songs and for the music and, and for just leading us into this place now where we can hear your word taught to us from you, from your Holy Spirit. And so Father, we pray that you will help us now to understand and to take in what this means. Not just, oh, that's interesting, but how do, how does this affect me and how should I live my life now, knowing that we now live under the new covenant. Father, we pray that you will bless this time that we share, open our eyes and our hearts to receiving your word, and change us, because your word is life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, as we read, our uh, focus verse is found in 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, so we're going to be in 2 Corinthians, even though we're going to jump around a little bit. But we're going to be mainly in 2 Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthian church from Paul. Okay. And, uh, and so we uh, are going to look at the old way first. Okay. So verse 7, he says, The old way, with laws etched in stone, led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. And, and that's, that's kind of like my prayer for us. Every time we come to church, and every time we meet together in this place, I hope that you leave here you walk out those doors with your face shining, like Moses' face. Because when you see God, when you see the face of God, your face shines. People know that you have been in the presence of God. That's what I want. That's what I want for all of us. When we leave here, people go, oh, we went to church. I know you went to church because your face shines. There's something about you that's different from everyone else, right? When people find out you're a Christian, oh, I, I should have known that. I should have known that you're a Christian because of how you are, right? You're different than everybody else. And that's, that's my prayer. My prayer is for all of us to leave here every Sunday knowing that we have met with God face to face. And, and, and what Moses had to do I mean, he, his face shone so brightly that he had to put a veil, right? He had to cover his face because he was too much of a distraction. People were afraid of him. Whoa, whoa, too bright, too bright. And so he had to hide his face from a veil. I don't think we have to worry about that because God wants us to let our light shine. Let our light shine. And that's what we're talking about here, is God's glory. right? For the, his face shone with the glory of God. And that glory was the result of this old way. right? With laws etched in stone. It began with such glory. But what does it say at the end of this verse? Though its brightness was already fading. It's, it's the glory of God, bright, shining, harsh. But because we're people and we make mistakes and we're imperfect, 
then this light begins to fade. Okay? And that's how we start. Right? So that's the that's what we start in Paul's letter. So let's go back and do a little research about this old covenant. Now the terms of the old covenant are found in Genesis 34, 28. And it reads, Moses reminded there on the I'm sorry, Moses remained there on the mountain, we're talking Sinai, with the Lord forty days and forty nights, and all that time he ate no bread and drank no water, which is incredible already. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone tablets. Okay, so the terms of the covenant. Now, God had made a lot of covenants. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with David. He made a covenant with Moses. He made a covenant with individuals. But this, this right here is a covenant made to the people of Israel. Right, the people of Israel. And, and, then, and of course, this was an important time because they had just left Egypt. They have no form of government. Right? They, they, are, they used to be slaves, no longer slaves, they're free, but they have no, no boundaries, no laws, no, no way of govern, governing each other. How do they take care of each other? Right? How do they handle disputes? Right? All of these things needed to be taken care of during this time. And so God gives them, God, being that this is a theocracy, God is the person in charge of authority over this nation, gives them their laws and okay, how to conduct themselves. So this word covenant, right, you find right here in Genesis. God wrote the terms. Now when you read about terms, it sounds like it's a contract, right? The terms of the contract. And, it's, and it is. A covenant is a contract. That is a binding legal agreement. Uh, the, the word covenant, though, in the Hebrew, uh, I, I, I've seen it translated in different ways, but in all of them, the one thing they have in common is that it means to cut meat. To cut meat. Not, not to cut plants or not to cut uh, with scissors. It's to cut meat, right? the word covenant. And so when you think about the covenants in the, and this goes back many, right, back in the times of Abrams, when Abraham was around, before he became Abraham was Abram, <clears throat> he had to, when he made a covenant with Lot, uh, they had to cut animals in half. Right? They cut the animals in half. And it was a ceremony that says, this is our agreement. This Cutting these animals in half and walking between them is our covenant. So, but, but when they say when we say cutting animals in half, we don't mean cutting them in half this way, right? We mean cutting them in half this way, right? And then and then laying them out this way, okay? So it's cut down from nose to tail and then opened up, right? with all their insides facing up, right? And now, why is that? It's, it's disgusting, yeah. but, but <laughs> what, it, what it shows is that if you fail in this contract, then this could be your punishment, right? So it's a binding agreement. I am going to hold on to this agreement so that I'm not like these animals. Cut in half. Open it up, right? There has to be a shedding of blood, which tells you that it's binding because blood is life. Right? And so these animals are kind of half laid open. Circumcision, there's blood involved in circumcision, okay? <clears throat> circumcision is for boys, right? Jewish boys. And, and, and when they turn 13, they go through. Um, a ceremony called a bar mitzvah. Well, bar means son. Mitzvah is of the covenant. So, son of the covenant is 
a way for them. This is their ceremony of saying, you are now under the covenant. You are now no longer the authority of your parents. Because if, any, if they do anything bad, right, under 13, before their bar mitzvah, if they do anything bad, it's the parents that get arrested. It's the parents that have to pay. But if after the bar mitzvah, if they do anything wrong, then it's on the children and not the responsibility of the parents. Because now the children are under the covenant, son of the covenant, which means they need to obey the law, the Ten Commandments and the other commandments in uh, Leviticus. Okay? So that's where the word covenant comes from, because normally we don't use covenant. We use vows, or we use contracts, right, uh, instead. <laughs> we don't cut animals open. <laughs> and open them up and have them walk between them. So that's where that comes from. Uh, now, now, what happens? What's, what, what are the terms of this contract? Uh, and, and the way I teach science, <clears throat> the way I teach science is uh, if, if I use the word if, then there needs to be the word then. Because if this happens, then this happens, right? It's, Cause and effect. Cause effect. And in science, as as with everything else, and, and, and I wish they had taught me history this way. I wish because right when, when I was growing up, I don't know about you, but in history we had to learn people's names, what they did, and what year or what time frame, right? It was memorizing. I, I hate memorizing. I hate memorizing. But if they taught me history from the viewpoint of cause and effect. Because this happened, then this happened. Uh, but if this didn't happen, then maybe this would not have happened, right? So if I had seen it from the viewpoint of cause and effect, then I can say, yeah, we need to learn that because guess what? We're repeating a lot of those things right now. If we had just learned all the causes and what happened, maybe why are we still doing that? If we always see the same results, right? Like we should do something different. So. If then, so so I saw the ifs in verse uh, in, in, in Exodus 19 verse 5, but I, I I added the word then, so the end is then is not in the Bible, but I put that in there uh, just for us to be able to distinguish. If you do this, then this will happen. Right? So cause and effect. So, um, so now if you will obey me and keep this covenant, right, keep this contract, this is God speaking, then you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples of the earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel, right? So if you, if you obey and keep this contract, then I will make you my own special treasure. Right? My people. Wow, that's that's a, a good thing, right? That, that's something that we should attain to. This is God saying, hey, it's important to obey and keep this contract. So, and, and that's why that last part, right? It's a promise contract between two parties. If you do this, and I will do that. So right now, this is what happens if then, cause and effect, if you obey. What happens if we don't obey? Because the law is so perfect. Well, as you can tell right away, it's a whole lot more if you just obey. I'll try to read it. It's, I should have broken it into two slides, sorry. Right. Leviticus 26, verse 14. However, if you do not listen to me or obey these commands, and if you break my covenant by rejecting my decrees, treating my regulations with contempt, and refusing to obey my commands, verse 16, then I will punish you. I will bring sudden terrors upon you, wasting diseases, burning fevers that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. You will plant your crops in vain, 
because your enemies will eat them. I will turn against you, and you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you, and you will run even when no one is chasing you. Verse 44. But despite all this, okay, so so we read in 14 to 17, we read what happens, right? If you disobey, and if you treat my laws and my commands with contempt, if you disobey them, then you will be punished. And, and this punishment he talks about right here, it's going to be sudden. It's going to be wasting away. People are going to die. Crops are going to fail. Enemies will eat them. Right? All of these things will happen. And they did. Right? God, God was true to what he said. He punished them. Enemies came in all the time. Right? Through the, after, in fact, what's really interesting is right after Joshua, with all those judges, this is what's happening. This was happening through the kings. This was happening uh, all the way to exile. And exile is when God says, well, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I have to punish you now. I need you to come back to me. Right? It has to be so severe that they turn back. They said, well, we, 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 we have broken. God is right. God fulfilled his part of the covenant. He punished us. Bad. Verse 44, though, in the same chapter, <clears throat> there's always hope. Right? God is always hope. But despite all this, <clears throat> I will not utterly reject or despise them while they are in the land, of, while they are in exile in the land of their enemies. Now, this is Leviticus, right? This is not even in the time of the judges. This is still supposed to be in the time of Moses. <clears throat> I will not cancel my covenant with them by wiping them out, for I am the Lord their God. For their sakes, I will remember my ancient covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of all the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Right? So, no matter how much his people rejected him and disobeyed him, he was still fulfilled. God will not cancel his covenant. And that's something that we need to always remember. Always remember that God is always faithful. God does not break his promises, even though we deserve it. But he tells us we will be punished, but he will restore. Right? He, he, and, and that tells us that he really is like a heavenly father. He will punish to correct us, but he still loves us. Right? The relationship is still there. Because, And what's really interesting is that, and, and, and we'll see this at the end, God initiates all the covenants. God is the one. It wasn't people saying, hey, God, let's uh, make a deal. Right? No, every single covenant started with God. And, and because it started with him, he is going to be the one that keeps it. He is the one that's going to maintain it. And he will be faithful to whatever he promises. Because right? he started it. So uh, now that we've gone through, uh, so let's summarize. Let's summarize the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant, uh, we said, was uh, in, our, in the very first verse that it was etched into stone, right? Which means that this was the Ten Commandments, the two tablets that Moses brought down from the mountain, right? It is the term for maintaining the covenant and remaining in God's favor. So if we do them, then we will be in God's favor. <clears throat> However, by disobeying the Ten Commandments, or the law, you are violating the terms of the covenant and must receive God's punishment as he promised. Right? God is patient, but there's a limit to that patience. Right? He's not going to wait until you completely destroy yourself. He is going to punish you, correct you, bring you back. Right? We 
restore you. Despite the repeated disobedience of his people, God is faithful to his end of the contract of the covenant because, like I said, he is the one who initiated it. The weakness of the contract or the covenant is not the law. The law is not the weakness. Nor is God. God is not the weakness. It's us. We are the weakness of this covenant. And I think that's what the law is trying to do. The law is trying to show us our need for a Savior. Because if God gave us a law that we could do, then it diminishes His holiness. And there, God is holy, 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 right? Holy, holier, holiest. Right? That's why it's repeated three times. Right? And so, therefore, because of His holiness, His law must reflect who He is. However, we can never meet this law. That's why it, that's why we as Christians call this the Old Covenant. Of course, Jews don't call this the Old Covenant because this is their covenant. For the Jews, this is their covenant. They don't call it the Old Covenant. They don't call this Old Testament. <clears throat> we as Christians call this old covenant because there is a new covenant right? just like there is a new year uh, there is a new covenant so what's the difference between covenant and testament so uh, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament and New Testament the result of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant well let's take a look so we said that a covenant it is a legally binding contract between two parties that involve conditions if the contract is followed and if the contract or the covenant is broken, right? <clears throat> so being that it's legal, and so the word testament sounds like the word testimony, right? And a testimony is given by witnesses. So, um, so the witnesses are sworn to tell the truth. Witnesses, in this case, the witnesses of this covenant are those who are to enforce it and to follow it. Right? So, the Old Covenant and the Old Testament are the same thing. The te because the testimony of the Old Covenant is the law. But in the New Testament, there is a new contract. And so because of this new contract, we call this the New Testament. Because those who live under this new covenant follow a different promise. A different contract. So that's what we need to get into next and find out what is this new covenant. Okay? And then, and so, yeah, there, there is a, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament are accounts of the Old and New Covenants. Okay. So let's return back to 2 Corinthians because that's uh, a letter that Paul is writing. Now, Paul in verse 13 says, <clears throat> he writes, We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was, des um, was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds. So they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand the veil that covers God's glory. Now, there, there are two ideas behind this veil. One is it becomes a distraction to those who are, un, they're just frightened by Moses' face shining. And so therefore they kind of hide away from that light. They're afraid of God's power. But it could also mean, in, in this verse kind of shows that, that Moses knew that his face, that the shining of his face was starting to fade. And so he didn't want people to think that 
God was leading him, that his that what happened to him was changing, and so he hid his face so that others didn't see that God's glory was leaving him. So there are two thoughts on this veil. But here Paul is saying, we're not like Moses who put a veil over his face. In fact, the veil can only be removed by believing in Christ. The veil is what separates us from God's understanding. And so the, it, it separates us from seeing God's glory. So we need to remove this veil so that others can see God's glory in us and so that we can see God's glory for ourselves. He says, even today, when they read Moses, they, being his own people, read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. They don't understand the significance of Jesus, even today. So, let's take a look at uh, verse, uh, let's continue with verse 16. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's today's scripture verse. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Wow. So, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. We are able to see God who He really is. He is the Spirit. And it's important to know that God is Spirit because that way He can be everywhere at the same time. He can hear millions of prayers all at the same time and know every single one of them because He doesn't have two sets of ears. He doesn't have a set of ears, right? He doesn't have two ears that's limited. He has a Spirit who is able to hear everyone's prayers and can answer every single one and remembers every single one because he is spirit. And spirit, I mean, spirit is like what happened last night. And spirit is a wind, right, that flows and moves and, and is everywhere. It is our atmosphere. It's what you're breathing, right? It's everywhere. And so God's spirit is everywhere. Right? We, they talk about this river of atmosphere that's causing all these storms to line up. Well, we don't see it. It's there. We know it. We see evidence of it. Right? Branches all over the place. Right? My neighbor's tree in my yard. Right? I mean, it's everywhere. Right? And, and then it didn't just happen. But there was. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. We know. We heard it last night. Right? It's a wind. God's spirit is like that. We don't see his spirit, but it is everywhere. It permeates everything. First Corinthians, the first letter, chapter 11, verse 25. And, and we read this last, last week, right? Read this last week, Lord's Supper, right? The new covenant. This is what Jesus said. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament or New Covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as long as often as you drink it. And in, in a way, it kind of goes back to, and, and now it makes sense to me, right? Now, because this is what I learned, because every time I preach to you, I'm learning something. I don't know. I learned that the word covenant has to do with cutting and shedding blood. And now, whenever I hear this verse read to us at the beginning of each month for the Lord's Supper, this covenant and blood are connected. It's a connection because all covenants must require the word covenant itself means cut to shed blood. This cup is the new covenant between God and his people. And now we are included in this, his people. Not just the 
nation of Israel, but all of us, an agreement confirmed in my blood. So, this is the new covenant. The new covenant is Jesus. Jesus is the new covenant. No longer the law. And remember, Jesus said, I did not come to condemn the law, but to fulfill the law. And he lived it. He lived the law. He's the only one that can do it. So in his life, he fulfilled the law. But because of his blood, he gives us a new contract. The new contract is by the shed of his blood on the cross. Which goes back to what's in green, which then gives us freedom. So let's talk about the benefits of the new covenant. The new benefits of this covenant. Because of this new covenant in Christ, we, as his followers, have freedom. Because God is a spirit. We have freedom from guilt, from our disobedience, because of God's grace. God's grace. And, and it's a hard thing for us to remember and understand grace. Because it's grace is not something we do as humans. We learn grace from God. We are forgiven. We have freedom from addiction. Because God's spirit is changing. We have a new priority, right? And so it's God that changes. this. It's not because of how you behave. That's why resolutions don't always work, because I'm trying to change the behavior. I need to change me from the inside. Only God can do that. I have the freedom to be loved and accepted for who we are right now, just as we are. We have that freedom to be loved and accepted by God. Right now, not because of something you have to do or you have to memorize these verses. Or no, there's no condition. God loves you right now. You have the freedom to take risks and be bold for God's work and ministry. Don't allow persecution to bind or hinder us. We have that freedom to just hey, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go and, and build homes. Let's go and and reach our community. Let's go and tell people about coming to church. It's nothing to be afraid of. We have that freedom to be bold. Take risks. We have the freedom to remove the veil and reveal God's glory to show Jesus in us to everyone. We have the freedom now of just showing God's glory. Right? And that's again my prayer that we all leave here today and shine God's light. Right? Every Sunday, Hearing his word, knowing that we met with him, you're different. You're a different person than when you came in. And then the last one is to have the freedom to leave this body behind and to receive a new eternal body without that. And that is our hope that it extends to all eternity, not just now. So, benefits of the new covenant. So let's summarize the entire message now. Number one, God is perfect and his law is perfect, but we are imperfect. Well, that is the truth. God initiated every covenant between himself and chosen people and nations and all of us. But God initiated all the covenants. God lived up to his end of the covenants, but in the end, his people the weakness of the Old Covenant was not God or His law, but our disobedience and our unfaithfulness. There had to be a new covenant. Because we would all die, we would all be separated, we would not have eternity with Him. So, the new covenant is with Jesus. God initiates a new covenant and the last one is Jesus' blood was shed to seal this new contract so that we have a new relationship with God based on grace, His grace, not our obedience. And because of God's grace, we have freedom. Because He is Spirit. And when we say He, who are we talking about? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? And so it's He 
is all of them. Because God's Spirit is God, Father, Son. Okay, so in our reflection, all three, Father God, Lord Jesus, help me understand that uh, the freedom that I have because of your Spirit and change me this year. Help me to understand the freedom I have because of your Spirit and change me this year. So let's make this our reflection in this new year. I'll give us a minute to reflect, say this prayer, and then we'll be Father God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this time that we can come and hear your word and to know that you are the one who initiated the covenants. It is you that wants a relationship with your people, your creation. And you started off with the law to show us your holiness, but you ended with a new contract, a new covenant that shows us your grace. The show, the, the law is merely a mirror, a reflection that shows us your perfection and shows us our sin. But because of that sin, it reveals to us our need for the new covenant, and that is to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, to follow him and to be under the new covenant. Father, we pray that you will cause us to leave here today with a better understanding of you, knowing that we have met with you this morning. May our faces shine. May our lives shine. That others will see Jesus Christ in us. We pray all this.